With that said, I'm going to take you into our study. Mark chapter 13, verses 32 through 37. Beginning at verse 32, Jesus said, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Take heed and watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It is like a man going to a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. And so let me give to you, as I normally do, a synopsis, an introduction, a review, so we can come to this passage with understanding. We've been studying chapter 13, and we've been studying Jesus' answer that had been asked to him uh, by his men. As Jesus and, and his men were leaving the temple, his men had noted the beauty of the temple. In verse 1 of chapter 13, they had said, Teacher, behold or see what manner of stones and buildings are here. I mentioned this to you, but the temple was the center of Jewish life. As a building, it was incredibly beautiful. At this time, construction had been uh, going on uh, as they were rebuilding the temple. Uh, it had actually been uh, worked on, uh, and additional buildings had been added, and repairs had been made over the span of 46 years. And so, because of this, uh, it was magnificent to look upon. It was breathtaking. And because it was, Jesus' disciples called his attention to it, and his response must have absolutely surprised them, because in verse 2 he had said, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. So his response provoked the disciples to ask, Well, when will these things be? What will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? So the entire 13th chapter of Mark is really the answer to those questions. So as we've been going through the chapter, I've, I've noted with you how that Jesus outlined the conditions concerning his coming. There's going to be a period of general tribulation that occurs during what is called the church age, the age that we're in now. But after the rapture of the church, the tribulation will begin with escalating judgments for the first three and a half years. The abomination of desolation will occur in the middle of the tribulation, and then the great tribulation ensues from that point. And at the conclusion of the seven-year period, Jesus will return. So in our last study, we saw how Jesus spoke concerning his second coming. He had said, be ready to those who are alive in those days when they saw these things. He was speaking of those who were going through the tribulation and it would, would endure and come to the end of it. And so he had said to them, be ready. In verse 28, he said that summer is near. In other words, when these things take place, his return will be soon. In verse 31, he had made it clear that his return was certain and it was guaranteed by the word of God. Like it says in the book of Isaiah 40, verse 8, how the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. For us, these words are instructive. They're to inspire dedication and, and faith. It gives us hope in the midst of so much evil that we live in in our world every day. For those who are alive when these things are occurring, his words are supposed to inspire urgency. With so much deception and judgment, they're to be on the alert. So as we look at these verses, Jesus uses the word watch four times. In verse 33, notice he says, take heed and watch. In verse 34, the man commanded the doorkeeper to watch. In verse 35, watch therefore. And in verse 37, he closes by saying, watch. And so Jesus is speaking concerning the conditions prior to his second coming and the conditions that are leading up to it. And so as he's continuing and teaching in verse 32, he says, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. The exact moment of his return, in other words, is unknown to man or to angels. No one can predict the date of his return. Why? Because his date is not revealed in Scripture. There will be visible signs that his return is approaching, 
But those signs should be causing people to be prepared for his return. But the precise moment is something he says that only the Father knows. Notice verse 32 how he says, Of that day and hour, no one knows. But in spite of that, in spite of Jesus pointing that out, no one knows, people still try to guess the date. I could give you so many examples, but a couple of them come to mind, and I'll share these with you. Because there have been various uh, individuals who've actually written books. They've written books trying to guess when this is going to happen. All the way back in 1988, before many of you were born, there was a guy named Edgar Wisenant, and he wrote a book. It was called 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Be in 1988. He said Jesus would return between September 11th and September 13th during Rosh Hashanah, or the Jewish New Year. Well, when it didn't happen, the next year he wrote another book, 89 Reasons Jesus Will Return in 1989. There's a fellow, some of you perhaps has heard, have heard his name. His name is Harold Camping. And Harold Camping wrote a book saying that Jesus would return in 1994. He repeatedly said he was 99% sure Jesus would return in 1994, but obviously was wrong. You see, every time something like this happens, it undermines the credibility of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But it also undermines the faith of innocent and trusting believers. The Apostle Paul, when he was writing to the church of Rome in uh, chapter 16, verses 17 and 18, said this. He said to the, the leadership there, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them, for such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Those who are, are, are innocent, those who have a naivete, those of, who are just wanting to believe, in, uh, and I'm trusting this minister, well, well, Paul says, be aware of them, note them, mark them, stay away from them. Why? Because they're deceiving and undermining the faith of those who are weak or are still immature. That kind of, of thing can undermine our expectation that he's actually going to return. So it has, to, it has to be dealt with because it undermines faith and, and therefore must be avoided. You see, the church has been instructed to live as if Jesus is returning even today. We're supposed to live as if he's coming today. Various scriptures reveal that. Jesus can come at any moment. Paul, when he was writing to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 7, 29, said it like this. He said, this I say, brethren, the time is short. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, all these things happened to them as examples. They were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. In Philippians 4, verse 5, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord, he says, is at hand. So the understanding that the time is short, the Lord is at hand, is actually to encourage us to live for Christ, to encourage believers in Jesus to live a, a holy life. And so Jesus is speaking about that, but he makes it clear in verse 32 again, of that day and hour, no one knows. So don't be predicting dates. Don't be undermining people's faith. He continues, and he says, neither the angels of heaven. No one knows, neither the angels of heaven. Now that's a significant thing for him to say because angels are heavily involved in the second coming of Jesus. They return with him according to Matthew 16, 27, there it says, the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he'll reward each person according to what he's done. In Matthew 25, 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. Angels are involved. They return with him. And not only that, but they're used to separate the saved from the unsaved according to Matthew 13, verses 39 through 42. Jesus said the harvest is the end of the age. The harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out his kingdom, out of his kingdom, everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. These angels, as Scripture says, 
are heavily involved, and yet they do not know when this is going to take place. They don't know the exact time. It's interesting how in verse 32 he said, no one knows, including the Son of Man, including himself. Now, this was spoken in view of his human nature. It speaks of the fact that he voluntarily restricted his divine prerogatives. Jesus had self-imposed restrictions on his human knowledge. In John 15, verse 15, he said it like this. He said, everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. So Paul spoke of that in Philippians 2, 5 through 7, when he said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man. So during his incarnation, the Father alone has unrestricted divine omniscience, total knowledge. Jesus lift, uh, limited his omniscience to what the Father had revealed to him. And in doing so, he was submitting himself to his Father's will. In John 12, 49, he said, I've never spoken on my own initiative or authority, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment regarding what to say and what to speak. What to say and what to speak. What to speak means and how to say it. But he said, I didn't do this on my own initiative or authority, but the Father gave me a commandment. So when Jesus was resurrected, he resumed his position. In Matthew 28, 18, it says, Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So his return is according to his father's timetable and plan. It wasn't disclosed to angels. It wasn't disclosed to himself. In Deuteronomy 29, 29, it says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may follow all the words of this law. There are secret things that are held back by the Father and there are things that are revealed. And that's why in verse 32 he says, only the Father, speaking of knowing the exact moment that he'll send his Son. Again, that's intended to keep his disciples serving and waiting expectantly. Zechariah 14, 5 through 7 in the Old Testament says it like this, then the Lord my God will come, and all the holy ones with him. On that day there will be no light, no cold or frost. It will be a unique day without daytime or nighttime, a day known to the Lord. And so that is something that the Father knows. We're presently living in a general period that precedes his return. The blossoming of the fig tree appears to have occurred when, when uh, the nation of Israel was reborn. But with that said, there remain specific events that are awaiting, we are waiting to transpire. That would include the rapture of the church as well as the seven-year tribulation period. So the signs that we've been looking at as we went through chapter 13 and all of those things are indicating, is to indicate to us the nearness of his return. Now, why weren't we told the precise moment? I think part of the reason may be because we would be tempted to put off coming to faith in Christ to the last moment. If I knew he was coming on such and so a date, I could be tempted to just continue living in the world and then to just say, well, he's coming back April 12th or whatever. I better get right with God. No, he, he wants us to be in a state of anticipation. And there are those who would say, well, you know, I'm going to wait until the tribulation, see what's really going on in that. Well, there's no guarantee that they could even make it through the tribulation. There's going to be a lot of martyrs during that time and a lot of death and, and, and all of that. And so we aren't told the precise moment so we can live as if it's today. Salvation isn't something, by the way, that you delay receiving. Salvation is something you sh should receive immediately. You don't wait till the last second. I, I have never met anybody, and I've been around for a while now, I have never met anybody who's come to faith in Christ. I have never met anybody who's ever told me, perhaps you're in this room right now or watching, but I have never met anyone who has said to me, I wish I would have waited longer. I've just never met anybody who has ever said, oh, I got saved too early. There was a lot of sinning I never got to enjoy. 
I, I've never met anybody like that. I, I, the only thing I've ever heard when people even speak in that way, I, I've heard them say, I wish I would have given my heart to Christ sooner. I would have saved myself, to be honest with you, so much pain. I would have saved my parents so much pain. I would have saved my brother and my sisters so much pain. I would have saved the, the people who are my friends so much pain that I brought into their life and so much hurt that I've, that I've brought into the lives of those that I said I cared about. No, I, I have for many years I have said to myself, would to God I would have come to faith sooner. So I've never met anybody who has ever said, I wish I would have waited a little bit longer. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, he says, in the time of my favor I heard you, in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. For those who are putting it off, those who are waiting, now is the day. Not next week, not next month, not next year. It's now. And that's what the Apostle Paul pointed out, and that's what God has said to us. So if you've come to faith in Christ, it means that we're to be living in anticipation of the return of Christ and again, we should be hoping that it's even today. In Romans 13, 12, the night is nearly over. The day is drawn near. So let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. In 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1, and therefore, beloved, since we have these promises, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that defiles body and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of of God. We should be prepared and living in anticipation of the return of Jesus Christ, hoping that it would even be today in the sense for us of the rapture. And obviously, those who are going through the tribulation, they'll be living in anticipation of seeing him. And so he says again in verse 32, of that day and hour, no one knows, not even Harold Camping, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Verse 33, he goes on to say, Take heed, watch, and pray, for you do not know when the time is. Notice how he says, Take heed, watch, and pray. So he's issuing a command to followers. He's, he's speaking to Christians. Take heed. In other words, be alert. Watch. Be ready for action. Pray. Depend on God. When the Lord comes, the ungodly will be forever swept away. They will never again have the possibility of receiving Jesus Christ. When you die unsaved, you go into eternity unsaved. There is no place in, the, in, in between your death and standing before God where you are given a second chance. Nowhere in Scripture does it ever teach that you have an opportunity once you've died to come to faith in God. Nowhere. There are people who will say, well, everybody eventually is going to stand before God and go to heaven. There are teachings that, that everybody is going to be saved. But the Bible doesn't teach that. Man has invented that. And so he tells believers, he says, take heed. When he speaks of that, he's speaking of being on the alert. Be on your guard. Be discerning. In other words, this requires personal attention. It's your responsibility to be on the alert. This is necessary now. It'll be necessary during the tribulation. Now, he's already spoken of taking heed in verse 5 when he had said, take heed that no one deceives you. Take heed speaks of personal responsibility. Well, I'm supposed to remain in the position of taking heed. That's a responsibility of every believer during every age. We're to exercise discernment to protect ourselves from deception. And this discernment, this alertness, being awake, well, that comes from the Spirit of God, and that comes from God's Word. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, John said, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit. Test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. During the tribulation, there is the false prophet and many false prophets. Even today, many false prophets have gone out into the world, denying Jesus Christ who bought us denying that God took upon himself human flesh, denying the need for the cross or salvation by faith in him. There are many false prophets who've gone out into the world and are deceiving many to this day. That's why he says test the spirit. You test the spirits through the discernment of the spirit, but you also test the spirits by the word of God. 
In 1 Thessalonians 5, 20 and 21, he says, Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. So you test them by the Word of God. You see, at that time during the tribulation, when so much is going on, deception will be rampant. So it's important to stay alert, to be awake, to watch. Now in verse 33, when he says to us, watch, the word watch speaks of staying awake. It, it speaks of being on the alert. It speaks of being prepared for action. The word watch is actually saying, be sleepless. Don't go to sleep. I had a stand watch. Every military veteran in this room probably knows exactly what that is. I had to stand watch when I was in the Army. They have you standing watch. You have to remain alert. They'd get you up at, for us, for me, uh, they woke me up at 3 in the morning. And then they gave me a little, uh, uh, an axe handle. And I walked around the barracks and walked in a certain perimeter. I had to do that to be on the alert in case somebody would come on, uh, uh, come on uh, Fort Ordon and, uh, and rob. And th they would do that sometimes and, and all of that. And we were told certain commands. You have to say certain things, stop, you know, halt who goes there, uh, identify yourself, those kinds of things. I still remember, I would, for some reason, this just came to mind. So I'll tell you. I got an old mind. It kind of, hey, remember that? So anyway, I was, I was in bed, and uh, I was at Fort Ord, and we had to sleep with the windows open because of uh, meningitis. And so it was cold, and, but we have, had to have the windows open. I still remember I was, I was in my bunk, and I heard a guy right out my window, right outside win my window saying, halt, who goes there? Then I heard this guy say, ah, oh, shut up. He says, identify yourself. That's what we were taught. Now, this guy's in basic training. He says, identify yourself. And the guy says something back to him. And so the guy who was given the commands hit the guy. He hit the guy who was talking back to him. He hit him with the ax handle. He hit him. I could hear a boom. Then all of a sudden... I hear, ow, 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 ow. Well, the guy he had hit took the ax handle from him and beat him up outside my window. <laughs> I don't know why I'm telling you that. But anyway, we, we had to stand guard, and it can be dangerous. You have to be alert. I saw the guy the next day. He had his head wrapped up with bandages. He got, um, there was a guy by the name of Lieutenant Kelly. Some of you may remember that name. It was associated with what was called the My Lai Massacre, where he had... Uh, ordered his troops to massacre a particular village. And he, it was a, it's a, a war crime. And he was, he was um, in jail. He was jailed uh, at Fort Benning in Fort Benning, Georgia. When I went through jump school, part of what I had to do with some of the people is we had to guard the place that, that uh, Lieutenant Kelly was at. We, we, we walked guard there. We guarded the perimeter. You're, you're, you're told to be on the alert, to be sleepless. Because if you go to sleep and the enemy is coming or approaching, uh, he, he can the, ep the enemy can devastate um, your camp. Uh, it, there's, there's many stories of when that happened, again, during Vietnam, when, uh, when they allowed the, the, the enemy combatants had allowed the American who was to be on watch, they watched him as he went to sleep. He fell asleep on guard. And then they came in and killed all of his friends. It's a very serious thing when you're told to be on the alert, be on watch, because danger is, is approaching. And so when Jesus is speaking in this way, he's saying, stay awake, stay alert, be prepared for action, be sleepless. He also goes on in verse 33, and he says, pray, depend on God, maintain your fellowship, seek the Lord for guidance. As it says in Ephesians 6:18. Pray in the Spirit at all times with every kind of prayer and petition. To this end, stay alert with all perseverance in your prayers for all the saints. Why is that? Verse 33, because you do not know when the time is. To be alert, to watch and pray, requires faith and patience. He's coming, but he's coming in his own time. He has not given us the exact moment, therefore we should be prepared as if he's coming at any moment. We patiently wait for him. The Apostle Peter in 2 Peter 3, 8 and 9 said it like this. He said, do not forget this one thing, dear friends. 
With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So to illustrate this, Jesus tells a, a, a story. He says in verse 34, it is like a man going to a far country who left his house and, and gave authority to his servants and to each his work, and he commanded the doorkeeper to watch. And so this rich man, as we read, he left his home and he was traveling, but he left his home and entrusted his, his servants to care for his home. Now, he fully expects them to perform the duties he's entrusted to them. He travels abroad, but he doesn't tell them when he's going to return. Now, the master we know in the story is Jesus, who will soon be crucified. His disciples are to carry on his work as he is gone until he returns. So as believers, we're to be busy serving, knowing that he will return. So the church is to be in a state of readiness. We're to be awaiting him. We're to be watchful. And, and it's going to be a while before he returns. And distractions will come. Distractions happen. Our, our lives are, are caught up with distractions. And it's, it just takes small things to awaken us to the reality of that. I'm watching a, a baseball game yesterday. They call it a baseball game. And my beloved Dodgers. Oh. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, John, would you please escort? <laughs> and, the, and, and they lose. It's a game. But I didn't, even wa I didn't watch it past the seventh inning. I said, I don't want to do this. And Marie's just sitting there, you know. She usually goes to sleep anyway, but. I'll wake her up and say, I'm upset, and I'll go back to sleep. <laughs> but you know how easy it is to be distracted? It is. It's easy. It's easy to be distracted. It's not like I'm supposed to be sitting there, Jesus, are you coming right now? I'm not saying that. It's just that I can, I, my joy, my happiness can be affected by the smallest things. And the Lord has been trying to teach me to keep my eyes riveted on the eternal things. And that's the way it's supposed to be, Right? So I'm supposed to be in the state of readiness. I'm supposed to keep my mind on the things that ultimately really matter. And it is going to be a while until he returns. And distractions, yes, they come. But notice in verse 34, he gave authority. So the work that is done is through the authority of Jesus. And, and it's not authority we've assumed for ourselves. The work that is performed is what is revealing that we are his servants. And notice in verse 34 how it says, he gave authority and to each his work. In other words, each servant has work to do. He's commanding the church to be busy serving him until he returns. Like it says in 1 Peter 4, verse 10, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. As everyone, as each one has received a gift. I was sharing with the first service this. I'll repeat the same sentiment with you. When you got saved, when you got saved, not only did you receive salvation, but when the Holy Spirit has indwelt you, God has also given to you spiritual gifts. Not only one gift, but most often you have what is called a gift mix, meaning there are more than one gift there, there's one, more than one gift that, that the Lord has bestowed on you. But every, every believer has at least one gift, at least one gift, at least one. There are various gifts, various kinds of, the, of ways that the gifts function, various usages of the gifts in church services or regular daily life. But every person has a gift. Every one of you, if you're a believer in Christ, has a gift. Now, the question is, do you know what your gift is? Do you know what you're gifted? Now, there are people who say, oh, I'm a teacher. How do you know that? Because I like to talk. Well, that's nice. But when you talk to people, listen, and do their lives change? See, so there are things that, that help you to understand that as you go through Scripture. How do you know your gift? 
Listen, when I first got saved, I, uh, I, I'm brand new. What do I know about spiritual gifts and all of that? And uh, I was like two and a half years old in Christ, and we were having a fellowship at my, at my parents' house. I had been in the military. I got out of the Army. It was during the summer of 1973. So at that time, I was probably 20, 22 years old or so, right in that area, 22. And um, we invited uh, a group of young adults to come to, to my parents' home. And a young man was there, and he and I were speaking in the kitchen. And my dad happened to be standing next to me as I was speaking to this young man. Again, I'm 22, less than 23. And he said something, and out of just conversation, it was all only conversation, he had said something scripture about the Scripture. And I said, well, that's really not what the Bible says. Now, that wasn't done in an arrogant way or a self-righteous way. It was a conversation. See, when I got saved, I, I started reading the Bible. I was told to do that. And then as I read the Bible, I, I started learning things. I actually was buying books that, that would help me to understand and all of that. I began to speak to, to people about Christ, and it was just a, an interest I had on my own. I figured if you get saved, you ought to know what you believe, and it's just that simple. It makes sense to me, and that's what I was doing. And so as I was sharing with this fellow, I, he had said such and so, and I said, well, you know, the Bible doesn't really say that um, because this scripture says this, and I quoted a couple scriptures, and so he says, oh, thanks. He said, I never knew that. And I said, yeah, isn't that cool? You know, it gives a conversation. He walks away. And my father says to me, I'll never forget this. My dad looks at me, and my dad says, I didn't know you could do that. And I said, do what? He says, I didn't know you could explain the scriptures so people could understand. I said, really? I didn't either, because it wasn't something I was thinking about. And so that's when I began to be aware that perhaps I have a gift to teach. Perhaps. Now, my mom got sick of my gift of teaching, and I have to be honest with you, because <laughs> she, she, she would ask me questions, and, and I would give these long answers. Sound familiar? And she'd say, David, can't you give me just a simple answer? And I'd say, Mama, the question you're asking isn't simple. There's, I said, the, 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 the Word of God is, is, is simple in the sense of being able to understand it easily, even a child can, but it's not simplistic. And what you're asking me to be is simplistic, to gel it down to something that really is just superficial. I can't do that. That's when I began to discover that maybe teaching is something I can do. What have you learned about yourself? What is it that you like to do? There's gifts of administration. People say, man, you just, oh, you, all the detail, 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 just do it. You may have the gift of administration. You, you may be a person who's just generous. You see somebody with a need, and, and, and you're there. You have the gift of helps. See, so read Romans 12. Read 1 Peter 4. Read 1 Corinthians 12 and 14. Read these passages uh, for, and these various places where the spiritual gifts are spoken of. And I'm telling you, as you seek the Lord in this, you'll discover what it is you should do because he's gifted you to do that. He's given you the ability to do that. And, and that's what gives you joy. That's what gives me joy. That's why I had somebody approach me in between service, and he said, you know, you're not supposed to retire. And I said, well, you want to shut up. What do you mean? <laughs> he, he, he says, you know, because ministers never retire, and there's truth to that. My pastor Chuck told me this one time, Chuck Smith, he said, I asked him, when do you retire? He says, when you get tired of talking about Jesus, which means you don't. You never do. And so what is your gift? Because we're to be busy, and that's what Jesus is speaking about here, by the way. That's what he's referring to. He said he gave to his servants, authority to his servants, and to each one his work, commanded the doorkeeper to watch. So each of us has been given this ability. Notice in verse 34, he commanded the doorkeeper to watch. The doorkeeper cares for those who are entering in or leaving the house. 
Doorkeepers had responsibility. They guarded the door to make sure no enemy would creep in. In John 10, verses 1 through 3, we see an example, uh, a, a similar example, where it says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Now, in a sense, believers are doorkeepers, but especially this could refer to the leaders of the congregation. In Ephesians 4, 11 through 13, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect or a mature man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So we've been given responsibilities. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, in our day, pastor, teacher, is given the responsibility to guard the door, to give the word of God properly. In 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 4, as we've been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. The doorkeeper's, doorkeeper's responsibility is to please God, to protect the sheep, to give those things that, that the sheep should hear in order that they're protected and they can grow and they're, they're not duped by the deceivers who come in. And so he's using an illustration of the one who is, who is there appointed to a task and he's watching. Now, this is going to be especially true during the tribulation when deception is rampant. They have to be on the alert. They need to be ready to welcome the master home. And therefore, verse 35, he says, watch. Watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning. Lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, Watch. He can come at any time. We're to be ready and we're to be awake. In Luke 21, 34 through 36, take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch, therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Watch. All the way back in 2004, some of you might remember, you're old enough to remember, the, the tsunami that hit and destroyed much in the east. It hit the the, the, uh, the land of, uh, of Thailand and devastated. I had the opportunity of going to uh, Phuket, Thailand uh, right after that had taken place. Uh, our fellowship, um, without us receiving an offering, uh, you know, by passing a bucket and all, I still remember saying to the church at that time all the way back in, in, in 04, I said, if you want to be of help to minister to these people who have been devastated. We went, I have pictures of the, 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 the water that rose up over, the, over eight to 10 feet. I mean, it was devastating. I said, if you wanna be of any help and all, then, then I, I'm not receiving an offering, but, but anything you designate, we will give to them. And, and about 100, almost $170,000 spontaneously came in from the congregation at that time to minister to those in that kind of need. And, and so we helped an awful lot. This fellowship helped an awful lot uh, those who had been devastated in this terrible, terrible uh, tsunami. And I remember watching a video of a man who was on a, on a rooftop. You could see the, the wave as he's on the rooftop and he's yelling because what has happened is he is at a vantage point. He's up here. He can look down, and we're there with him, if you will, 
uh, in the video, we can see the wave that is building. And some of you know this already, but a tsunami, what happens is the water recedes. It, it comes off of the beach area, and it recedes. It can go a quarter mile or further out than it normally is. And so from his vantage point, he sees this wave that's building. Now, I read an article that says that, the, that, that on the open ocean, this is hard to believe, but that the wave can actually outrun an airplane. I mean, it's coming in a way that's so devastating. None of us have an idea of what that is. But what it does is it, the wave, the water, as it's receding, all of the, the debris and the, you know, the trees and various things that are there under the water, it's all being sucked in by this enormous wave that is growing. And so if it hits you, it's like you go into you know, a, a blender. You're instantly destroyed. Your body is torn up. It, it doesn't appear that way. We, we don't know, but that's what's happening because there's so much debris. There's rocks and branches and everything inside this wave that the second it hits you, it obliterates you. You're gone instantly. And this man is standing on the rooftop, and he's looking out, and we're in his vantage point, so we can see the wave, and he's yelling and screaming for people, come off the shore, there's a wave. You can hear him screaming, and there's the, the translator is, is they're, they're, they're telling us what he's saying. Run for your life. Come off the shore. It's coming. It's going to destroy you. And there's a man with a basket, and he's walking, picking up the fish that have been left there because when the water receded, there were fish that remained behind. This is a guy who sells fish at a fish market. He's saying, what a blessing, what a benefit. I have all of these fish that I can now sell. He's looking at the fish and not the wave. And then you have the man up there screaming, run for your life as the wave hits him, and he's obliterated for some fish, a basket of fish. As a pastor, I feel that way myself. I have a vantage point through the word of God. It's coming. And there are people just picking up the fish. People are leaving and they're running to get away from the destruction. But this man is there picking up the fish. And Jesus says, watch. You don't know when it's coming. But it is as sure as God's word. It is coming. This will happen happen but many many pastors myself included can often feel like that man on that roof seeing something and nobody will listen there's a fable a story it's not in the bible it's just an illustration that tells of three apprentice devils who were coming to earth to finish their apprenticeship and they're talking to satan the chief of devils about their plans to tempt and to ruin men. The first said, I will tell them there's no God. Satan said, that will not delude many, for they know that there's a God. The second said, I will tell them there's no hell. And Satan answered, you will deceive no one that way. Men know, even now, that there's a hell for sin. The third said, I will tell men there's no hurry. Go, said Satan, you will ruin men by the thousands because the most dangerous of all delusions is that there is plenty of time. 1 Peter 4, 7, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Be serious and watchful in your prayers. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. Very often we use that scripture as an appeal for people to come to faith in Christ, but the context is dictating that the Lord Jesus Christ is telling the lukewarm church, you're not ready. I'm coming suddenly and you're going to discover that you weren't prepared. I just say to us as a church and those who are listening, Watch, be ready, be prepared. He comes in a moment that you don't expect. And the rapture is coming soon. May, may we be prepared to go with the Lord Jesus Christ.
Jesus is warning believers to remain faithful and expectant. Lord, I ask that you would work within us.